Before 2020, it seemed absurd to consider a shortage of materials. Trusty materials like steel supported new buildings, and materials of the future like cobalt went into fleets of futuristic electric vehicles. The trajectory of the future looked simple, bigger, stronger, faster. But didn't we all wonder how we were going to keep fueling our increasing appetite for more? Well, Peter Zion has collected the data and done the math, and he has surprises in store for all of us. Welcome to my channel. Today, I'm very excited to present a collaboration with my friends over at Geopop. We're using my interviews with Peter Zion, plus information from his new book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, to take a deep dive into the world of industrial materials. One of the great achievements of globalization is about bringing the inputs, food, energy, raw materials, to every country of the world who wants to play, which is every country of the world pretty much. <laughs> uh, but if you break down the supply systems, uh, the technologies of industrialization are not sustainable without those inputs. So we're gonna see large portions of this world, China is the country I'm most concerned about, de-industrializing as they simply can no longer maintain the inputs that make modern life possible. And keep in mind that two of the aspects of modern life are electricity and food. Peter weaves together history with demographics, geography, and international politics to paint a fascinating, although sobering, look at the world. He points out that the materials we rely on to make our technology and world work are embedded in the names of our eras. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. In the early 21st century, we are part of the Silicon Age. He outlines the importance of materials in defining these ages. Places that had oil, copper, and iron could advance quickly but it soon became apparent that one other resource was super important, skilled labor. Turning iron ore into actual iron required hundreds of people who knew what they were doing so governments were more likely to abduct blacksmiths than raid copper mines. Just when we thought we were making some progress, one third of Europe's population was wiped out by the Black Plague. The plague created religious, social, and economic upheavals with profound effects on the course of European history. It was that scarcity that actually forced breakthrough advances. This resulted in the Renaissance and brought the Industrial Age out of knowledge from the Iron Age. Today, we're beginning to see an end of the cheap, skilled labor that has enabled so much industrialization. To make matters worse, we've had our own little pandemic to contend with. Zion posits that maybe we're on the verge of a new Renaissance, and like the people of the Iron Age, we will reap the benefits of new breakthroughs. But these breakthroughs will not be possible without materials, and there may not be enough to go around. Whether it's to be produced, shipped, refined, purified, alloyed, or rearranged into value-added products, the materials of modern life require industrial age technologies. This is why it's so important to protect the sustainability and reach of the industrial technology set, because all of them can fade away and take their benefits with them. We've seen this breakdown of materials in history, and Zion cites some dire consequences. He then dives into the top 15 commodities going deep into where they come from and the likelihood of supply chain issues in the future. Broken into sections of always, future, essential, funky, and reliable materials, he explains the messy and complicated world of supply chains and the problems we will face in the future. When you start a power plant, a green tech power plant, one of the, the great things about it is if you can get the financing, the rest of it is easy street because two thirds of the cost is just the installation. There's no fuel. That's free. That's the sun. That's the wind. The uh, financial tail of it is very small. So you borrow up front, you basically prepay 10 to 20 years of your power bill, and then you're in the clear. Fossil fuel systems are different. The facilities themselves are relatively inexpensive. It's only about 20, 25% of the total life cycle cost. The cost is the fuel, and that's roughly 60% of the total. Assuming that they're equivalent, uh, a wind turbine needs that upfront financing. Well, people talk about how if you increase the cost of financing by 50 to 100 basis points that a project fails because then the financing costs are too high. We're talking about a world where we're going to, need to increase it by 500 to 1500 basis points. We're talking about a fundamentally new, different, tougher financial environment. And in that environment, very, very few solar and wind systems will be financed by the private market. And for everyone that the government does, that's something that the government is not doing somewhere else. So we've got a financial crunch just around the corner next year that starts and will not let up until we have a large generation in their 50s to generate that financial boost again. That will be the millennials, that won't be until the 2040s. 
So we're going to have a big period in the middle where this is just going to be very hard to do. Uh, second is the manufacturing of them themselves. Right now, solar panels are assembled in China. Now, there's nothing about that technology that prevents it from being relocated. We've been making solar panels in various qualities since the 70s. But making the actual solar cells is the easy part. Assembling everything requires fingers and eyes. You can't automate that. America is too expensive. Mexico is too skilled. So we would need to find another country that we can kind of fold into the network to make that happen. If I was a betting man, I would say Colombia. They're relatively proximate. There's already a free deal with the United States. The education levels for Colombian labor is high for their standard of living. And the labor costs are kind of where the Mexicans were in the 1980s. So you can do it, but you have to build all that industrial plant first. And you have to do so in an environment when North America is already trying to double their industrial plant because of deglobalization, because we have cheaper energy, because we have a more stable labor market. So all this has to be done at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have some significant inflation for several years. That is unavoidable, even with good plan. The essential materials are iron ore, which makes just about everything, including steel, which Zion predicts massive shortages in the future because although it is mined in Australia, Brazil, and the United States, it is processed and manufactured in China, Japan, Korea, Russia, and Germany. Bauxite is also essential as it creates aluminum and its supply chain will get messed up because the places where it is processed will face power shortages and price hikes. Copper is not going to fare much better as the expansion of the electrical vehicle industry means we will need a lot more copper in the decades to come. The future materials are cobalt, lithium, and silver. With most cobalt coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, the future of cobalt and lithium is not looking good. A lot of hope is riding on an ability to find a workaround in the production of batteries for electric vehicles. Add to this the fact that refining lithium is one of the most energy intensive processes and our transition to a so-called green energy electrification is not going to be smooth. Silver supply is looking better as it is eminently recyclable and Zion calls it the unsung hero of the modern age. Always materials are gold, lead, and molybdenum. The future of gold is secure as China can harmlessly be scooped out of the supply chain. Lead is also recyclable with advanced countries leading the way. A positive side effect of the breakdown in the supply chain of lead will mean more recently industrialized countries will have to improve their recycling programs which will make for healthier living environments. Molybdenum is mostly used for military applications, and its future is looking A-OK. -okay. Under Funky, there's platinum, which mostly comes from South Africa, and a cluster known as rare earth materials. This includes lanthanum, neodymium, promethium, europium, dysprotrium, yttrium, and scandium, among others. China does all the dirty work of refining these simple metals. Backup facilities exist in the US, South Africa, Australia, Malaysia, and France. They don't see much activity because the Chinese stuff is currently so much cheaper. China is the largest importer of nickel, but the top producers, Indonesia, the Philippines, Canada, and Australia, all have alternative markets in their neighborhoods. The future of silicon is less rosy. Purification is currently only done in China, Japan, the US, Germany, and Italy. This is going to make the production of semiconductors and solar panels very problematic. Uranium is likely to become more popular as a power fuel. Locations that face the most risk in sourcing sufficient supplies will be middle powers that lack the military capacity to source inputs and are in locations that preclude safe shipments. Switzerland, Sweden, Taiwan, Finland, Germany, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Ukraine, and Korea. Zinc is our fourth favorite metal by use, behind only steel, copper, and aluminum, and is easily recyclable. Even with broken supply systems, we'll still have zinc. Thanks for watching until the end. Be sure to check out our friends at Geopop and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. And leave any questions you have for Peter Zion in the comments so we can line them up for our next interview.